Hello? Have you ever done a podcast? I, I did the uh, Dancing Gnome podcast once. Uh, the Beer Me with, uh, uh, who was that, Mike Pound a couple times. Uh, you're way more professional than any of those, though. Oh, so, are they? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Dancing Gnome, I've talked to, uh, what's the owner's name there? Uh, Andrew. Andrew, yeah. yeah. I talked to him before, like, but... I don't know. It, it, like messages got dropped, but he was uh, he was supposed to come on here. I got to reach back out to him because yeah. I think I left that open ended. But I didn't even know they had one. Yeah. someone mentioned it before. I think uh, uh, Jerron Jerron is who does it mainly, and he used to do a boxing and beer podcast. And, and, was, uh, and like he did like a, a, a craft beer industry podcast before that. I think. How, how was he involved with Dancing Gnome? Uh, just a big fan. Oh, okay. You know? and, he, and, and they do a is there a pretty regular podcast? Uh, once a month. Okay. So it's like uh, equal parts. Here's what's going on, Dancing Gnome. Here's uh, what we're both doing. And then they bring in a, a character. Uh, oh, somebody cool. in the industry, somebody local to Sharpsburg, friend, whatever it may be. Yeah, that's awesome. So, I uh, I don't know. I appreciate anyone that's doing this stuff. It takes so much time. I, so it's I like, respect it because I know just, you know, doing anything takes time. And the investment you have in the whole studio here, that's, I respect it. Yeah, I'm like, I, I appreciate I could never, that. I could never commit to something like well, that. Well, you're a meticulous guy yourself. I see that you, no. you're very adamant about the lines. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're, you're very outspoken on the lines. And yeah. uh, I, uh, I, I don't know. I think that that's like a... I don't know. People recognize like whenever people are just like into something that they're passionate about. That's really it's what a, it is. It's a cleanliness issue, you know? Ooh. Like a... Uh, you know, if I was if I was a fry cook, I'd probably be passionate about how clean I keep a fry. Absolutely. You know, if I was a grill cook, I'd be passionate about how absolutely clean I keep the grill. If I was a custodian, I'd be like, look how clean that toilet is. You shine, know? shine to hell, right? What uh, are you from Pittsburgh originally? Yeah, born and raised outside of Pittsburgh, Carnegie area. Oh, okay. So. We were uh, we we did a stint in Ingram, so yeah. uh, not too far. Uh, are you still? Where do you guys live now? Live at now? Carnegie. Carnegie. Yep. It's a great place. It's we got a house years ago for cheap. Yeah. And, you know we're able to reinvest in the house and. You know, it's beautiful inside. Outside, it's your typical Pittsburgh it, house. They right, have you know? character, though. Yeah. The house yeah. is out there. I mean, like, you can go move out to one of them, like, uh, them new plans that they built, but it's, yeah. like, really cookie cutter. Yeah. Like, this house that we lived in in Ingram was, like, uh, like this old old big ass wild house that was split in two places right. and we had the second and third floor but it was just like such a unique looking thing all yeah. them all of them over there yeah uh are you so i mean obviously you are one of the one of the big dogs at piper's now but i mean like what's your, what were you doing as a kid like what's your background i don't know really anything about you i was i, I try to think about <laughs> I, I'm my guest try not to do that just be arrogant on the internet here and no, there i don't, no, I don't no. talk too much about anything else you know uh i grew up in the sticks like i said outside carnegie yeah uh, in a little town called rennerdale if anybody knows what the hell that is rennerdale uh, rennerdale that's uh it's a no stoplight town a couple stop signs uh there's a fire department a pond and a corner store so i grew up playing hockey obviously because that's what you do street yeah. hockey uh, pond hockey, like when it froze, you oh, yeah. skate on the pond because I guess the whole neighborhood was involved. That know? was before global warming started to take yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, I mean, like growing up, are you are you like uh, what kind of stuff are you into besides that? Like, are are, are you uh, do you come from someone that was into beer? No, no, well, I mean, not really at all. Like yeah. a great uncle owned a beer distributor years ago, but that wasn't it. Okay, you know, I moved to Colorado. I was eighteen and lived with some hippies, and they're like. Here's Fat Tire, here's Chimay, and then it just steamrolled from there. Moved back to Pittsburgh, started working for the Sharp Edge, which was a, a big beer bar at the time. Worked there for 10 years, got miserable, got other jobs, you know? Yeah, tale as old as time. Right. Well, well, before we even get into all the beer and stuff like that, you, uh, you're growing up, you say you're playing hockey and stuff like that. Uh, you're going through high school. Like, what kind of stuff are you thinking you're going to do for a career? I have no idea. I, I mean, still don't, you know? <laughs> I know. It's crazy how many people I interview that say the same thing. No idea. And Damn. they just end up end up somewhere. Right. What, uh, were you like someone that was into school or no? No. Yeah. Hated it. Yeah, everyone hates it. I hated waking up that early. Hated, hated it. Yeah. You know, well, hated the routine. So, I mean, like, what are your plans as you like after you graduate? Like, what's going on? Like, what do you think you're gonna do? I was gonna move to Colorado. Where'd that come from? I was chasing my wife. Oh, okay, <laughs> it was my girlfriend at the time. Yeah, she, she moved to Colorado doing an internship at a hotel. She was a uh, pursuing culinary career. 
And I was like, that sounds fun. Let's move to Colorado 18. What up? Wow. Not? Yeah. Just picked up and left. Yeah. What part of Colorado? Colorado Springs. That's awesome. So, how long were you there? Two years. You, I mean, like, what, how was yeah. that? It was the mid 90s. It was fun. Yeah. You know, it was. It was like on the on the cusp of the whole punk and ska scene. So every Tuesday night, you go down to the underground and see a five dollar ska show full of you know real big fish played there, Goldfinger played there. Sort of wow, it was fun, you know. Yeah, it was, it was a college town. There's a, a Colorado college is there, a liberal arts school. So uh, you know, if you're if you're under twenty years old, there's a lot of things to do that don't involve just going to a bar and getting blackout drunk. Yeah. So. Are you uh, are you someone that drinks at that time? Like, are you, oh, yeah. are you always a drinker? Oh, yeah. I worked I worked in the service industry. It's it's part of your life. You know, yeah. if you're not drinking, you're you're smoking pot. And if you're not doing one of those two, you got to work. You got to watch out. Like, Dude, you're, yeah, you're, either the harder stuff. You're, you're either in recovery or you're <laughs> about to be in a, in recovery. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's stereotypical for sure, but yeah. it's usually how it follows. Well, I mean, you go out there and you're. I mean, you just moved to Colorado. I mean, like, what are you doing out there to get by? Working in the hotel. Oh, okay. Bus, busting tables. You know, you, the, we worked at the Broadmoor, five star, five diamond hotel that paid well, but you had to you know, put in the hours. Uh, it was like a wild hotel. I was uh, like I said, still five, there. Five star, five diamond. It's like one of the one of a dozen five star, five diamond hotels. So it gets the the premier rating from Michelin. It gets the premier rating from AAA, and it's oh, it was wow. an experience because it, it taught a lot about uh, uh, taking pride in what you do. Obviously, you're you're one of the best hotels in the world. You have to act like it. Here's your here's your service standards. Here's how you wait on people. You know uh, the whole thing. Uh, be seen, not heard. Wow, a lot of things like that. So that was kind of instilled with you. I mean, obviously, stuff that you're using nowadays is probably Absolutely. comes from that. Yeah. So I mean, like it's interesting. I ask these like weird ass questions because I mean, I feel like was that your first initiation to like that sort of environment? No, Eaton Park. Eaton Park. Eaton Park. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Uh, the one on, uh, was it Vanadium Road? Oh, yeah, yeah. And Washington Road? Yeah. 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 And, uh, how long were you there? A summer or two. Cook? Oh, dishwasher. 16. Dishwasher. You know? I, I guess so. I guess. Yeah. I didn't know that back then it was wild time. How old are you? Uh, uh 47. 47. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you never know. It's wild west back yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. Would, uh, so, I mean, Colorado, you said you were there for two years? Yeah. Would, uh, and, and you came back here? Yeah. What brings things back here? Family. Yeah. You know, Colorado's fun, but it's sort of like that without that safety net of, you know, being two service industry people, not making a lot of money. And it's kind of like, if we, if one of us fucks up, we're going to be on the streets. You yeah. Know? So we moved back here. You just went out there alone? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, like, was that experience working there? Was that like a, at that point, did you enjoy it back then? Or was that just like, you know, just doing it? I mean, you're at the foothills of uh, of the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. There's so much to do. You can go hiking, go mountain biking. Uh, you know, it was just a great experience. But, you know, uh, you get into, like any job, you get into the intricacies of things. And, you know, a, a big hotel, there's a lot of ins and outs. And you sometimes you hit a ceiling where you're just like, well, I'm not going any further in this job. And yeah. this is all the further I'm ever going to get. I don't know if I want to do this. Yeah. So That makes sense. Yeah. So you come back here and what's, I mean, what happens after that? Uh, like I said, started working for the the Sharp Edge in about two thousand. Oh, that was whenever that happened. Yeah. You came back, started working there. Now it was uh, there were a couple other restaurants here and there, but you yeah, know, you know, came like, back, started working in restaurants again. Well, Sharp Edge, like the one over in like Ingram area, there was one of those. Yep. And where was the other one? Uh, when I, I left in two thousand ten, there was there was one in Crafton, there was one in Kensburg, there was one in Swickley. Oh, wow. There's the original one in East Liberty, and they were just about to open downtown when I left. Where did you work? I was the beverage director for all of them when I left. I started off as a bartender, worked, my, worked clawed my way to the top, as they say, you know? So that was like your, was that your uh, first stint at being a bartender? No, I worked for a couple of smaller places, a place in Swickley. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I learned my ropes there pretty much how to bartend. But And I mean, like, are you, do you, whenever you start that, are you like, uh, do you think of it as just a job, or do you think that you want to like climb the ranks in you know a service industry like that? No, sharp edge. I was like, I'm going to climb the ranks. I'm going to do this. This seems cool. You know, they were they were doing all Belgian beers at the time, or mostly Belgian beers, and it was sort of something unique. And I was like, we can do something here. And ultimately, the owner, you know, kind of capped what he wanted to do. Like yeah. I had ideas where to where to take it and navigate. You know, difficult scene of of, of of bars and service industry and he was like no we're not doing that so i was like i can't 
I can't do this. I yeah, can't. You gotta give me something to work with. Yeah. You know, it was, it was right about the, when I left, it was right about the time Giant Eagle opened up and they were selling a lot of the same beer we were, which was, was sort of obscure beer. But I'm going up to Giant Eagle, I'm looking at their prices, and it's like $5 for a bottle of beer. We just raised the price to $14. And I go to the meeting the next boss. I was like, we got to rethink, man. We had all these coolers of beer that they're selling for a third. We're selling. Like, I, just, I just don't think like, the customer's going to catch on. Yeah. And the owner looks at me and goes, customers don't know any better. Yeah. And I'm like, I just sent you an email from a Blackberry. That's how long ago it was. I just sent you an email from my pocket, man. Like, people are going to figure this out. People for are sure. People are going to figure out. What year is this? That was about 2010. And 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 whenever you said uh, Giant Eagle just started up, and do you mean like you know th- was that the first year they started selling alcohol? Yeah. Uh, and and like at that point, uh, like I know that the craft industry started to like you know, like like where does your initiation of that kind of take off? Like when does it like go beyond regular you know fucking paps and all that stuff? Like in Colorado. Oh, is like that I said, okay? Yeah. Me a local beer there or Chimay there, and I was kind of like this. This tastes better than Coors. Now out there. Yeah. I mean, they were obviously on it a little bit quicker than we were. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was always, you know, when, when we moved back here, I said, you know, I started working for Sharp Edge. My wife worked for Valhalla when it first opened up, which was a first wave, like, Pittsburgh brew pub. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I was involved with that. I knew people that worked at the Foundry, which is long gone. But I knew a lot of these people in these smaller breweries in the early 2000s. Uh, again, because I worked for the Sharp Edge, which focused on Belgian beer, but we also had... A lot of other beer yeah so you know that's you know another difference in in opinion with the owner there was like i'd rather buy beer from somebody i know <laughs> than this guy in california i've never met yeah so. it's interesting to kind of hear how the the brewery boom kind of like you know came into pittsburgh because i you know i'm not like that tapped into it i right. know i know enough about of it now but uh the the beginning of it all was so wild to me because like i don't know like like did you would you say that you were pretty experienced in it all like were you well versed in it all like did you because i just interviewed austin yeah. uh from uh, carson street deli and like you know he was like yeah i wasn't you know i drank paps in the beginning and I, yeah. it, it's interesting because uh i guess the guy who used to run carson street deli like you know he kind of started to get in from the from the beginning on like you know that craft brewery scene and I, and like i said to Ale, or austin i was like it's, it's it seems like a risky move in the beginning because like you know in 2010 like where was the brewery scene in that point it was a lot of the old guard you know church brewworks east end uh brewers that you know some of them were still around but, yeah you know there the there wasn't there weren't 50 brewers there's like six yeah so uh i think a lot of what happened was there's was pittsburgh craft beer week which I was a part of, uh, helped, you know, bring attention to, hey, look, there's more to drink than just Coors Light. There's more to drink than just Icy Light. Yeah. So that opened up a lot of opinions, opened up a lot of eyes, and also, like, it opened up a lot of people to, like, I, I can brew at home, I can home brew, uh, and I know, you know, probably 80% of the breweries open, you know, that opened in the past 10 years are like, I started off as a home brewer, I loved it, I have enough money to make a business out of it, let's do this. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting because it's like, I mean, like once you figure out, you could like kind of fine tune it and make it to your, like cater to your flavor. People right. like want to get involved with it all. Right. Or were you ever a home brewer? Yep. And, and I mean, like, would you say you were a decent one in the beginning or did it take you a minute to get a hold of, get a hang no, of I was, it? I was just arrogant. Yeah. I wasn't very good, but I, I thought I was. Yeah. So, but I, I, you know, as I started home brewing because I, you couldn't. You couldn't buy the, the kind of beer I wanted to drink locally. Which was that? Uh, West Coast IPAs, real kind of kind of pale bitter stuff uh and you know like i wanted to, i wanted to drink that so i started making my own and then as these brews opened up i was like you know I, it's it's so much easier to go buy a four pack from somebody i know yeah than to spend all day brewing beer and yeah then, you know, next week checking on it maintaining it plus all the all the expenses you know you, you start home brewing and you're like okay i bought this 200 hundred dollar kit and i have two cases empty bottles that's it. And yeah. then, you know, three years later, you're $15,000 into a system with stainless steel everywhere and transfer hoses and pumps. And you're like, what am I doing here? I could have bought a Toyota. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, like, I mean, your your time at Sharp Edge, I mean, you climbed your way up there and you said you were the drink, like uh, the beverage director. Bever- beverage director. Yeah. Sorry. I, I always try to get the terminology it's all, it's all correct. Uh, it wasn't really, uh, you know. I was just going to ask, like, what does that mean? Like, what you're, you're just buying all, you're sourcing all the... 
yeah beers and everything so like we that? had like 40 taps at each restaurant ah. uh, and there was you know we had so many you know because we were a belgian themed place there were so many beers that had to be belgian and sourcing those dealing with the you know the local wholesaler the the national importer sometimes the uh the the, the brewery in belgium it was a lot of coordination because uh you know trying to track down you know 25 kegs of a of a, a golden drop a belgian dark beer in 2006 you know per quarter was sort of a it, it was tough you yeah. know now it's it you know it's it, it's almost everywhere it's ubiquitous but you know 20 years ago it was not so i was doing a lot of that managing the beer list managing you know what they're purchasing what they're selling uh, and training people how to clean draft lines which is just <laughs> my sisyphusian uh, uh thing it's just all i do is clean draft lines yeah i you mean know? like if you have a place with that that many i mean it, and it's interesting because you talked about working at the hotel because like you, i mean like a, 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 a well-oiled you know kitchen is mm-hmm. usually like you know militarized you know cleaning things like that like exactly what you see in the bear yep. uh and i don't know it's sick how that kind of probably sucked at the time a little bit but it's cool in the long game like training people is, is always the toughest thing you know in clean training somebody to clean draft lines who you know it's, it's sort of a dirty cold job and if they don't have an idea what they're doing it's tough to to train that yeah and 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 still why you're doing it rather than just being like hey just do this yeah but like you know yeah, this is it, why it, we do it's it it's not like cleaning a plate where everyone is like oh this is how you clean a plate i yeah. can do that you know cleaning draft lines is uh you're dealing with high pressure uh, water solutions you're dealing with the uh, cost of chemicals you're dealing with acid solutions and you got to worry ppe you got to be you got to be concerned about safety and then when you put a, put it all back together, you're putting you know twelve beers back on the same place they were, putting the tap markers back on the same place. So it's you know. So in your time there, I mean, you obviously didn't hate it enough to go into something else. I mean, it, I I, <laughs> I thought it was going to be bigger than it was, you know. And yeah. It's it, it's a whole long story about why I left there, but you know, long story short, the they decided to expand rather than uh, give anyone a raise, and I was uh, okay. like, I'm, I've had enough of this. Yeah. I can't. I can't. I can't open a two million dollar restaurant in your back without a raise in three years. You know? Yeah, for sure. So you, you, I mean, like, so after after you're at Sharp Edge, obviously you learn a lot of your shit there. But it's like, what's your next move? I I sort of rage quit and started <coughs> working at Mad Max as a busboy at thirty years, some years old. You know, <laughs> thirty two years old. Uh, a friend of mine worked for Mad Max uh, on Green Tree Road. Just kind of walked in, and was like, I need a job, and he's like, I don't have anything right now, but I will in three months. You know, like. Here's some service shifts. Here's some busing shifts, and you can nickel and dime your way into something. Which you know, going from working sixty hours a week at the Sharp Edge down to working thirty some hours a week for Mad Max was like a, a huge mental break. One of those things, like oh, I can get things done around the house. You know, sort of a a, mon- a mental refresh. Yeah. And uh, you know, as as the mental refresh wore on, I was trying to find other jobs and you know, trying to get back into restaurant management because. Again, I'm just blessed. To, that's the only thing I know how to do. Uh, Twitter started about then. Like I figured out Twitter, so it's it's <laughs> like it's like a summer 2010, early fall 2010. I'm just I'm I'm being a menace on Twitter uh, about customers at Mad Max because South Hills customers of restaurants are sort of a yeah a special breed. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm just being a menace, uh, and the owner of the Shark, of the owner of Piper's Pub hits me up, and I'd, I'd met him a few times in the industry talk to him good guy mutual mutual hatred of my previous job at at, at sharp edge what's the owner's name drew drew yeah okay he hits me up out of the blue and he's like hey one of my longtime bartenders just quit you want a job and i'm like piper's pub i fucking love that place why not yeah let's let's check this out at 2010 what is piper's pubs like reputation like are they like like because i don't know that much about it they they were the soccer pub then yeah uh you know in 2010 uh (laughs) <laughs> the the reason that the longtime bartender left is he hurled a fucking slur oh, okay. at, at somebody. And that was the, the attitude a lot. If you, you're like, I watch soccer, like, yeah, okay, bud. Yeah. You know? Uh, so uh, they, they were known as the soccer bar. They'd be open early morning, Saturday and Sunday with games. No one else would walk, you know, no one else could show because he, he was running a C band. He was running a, you know, whatever, whatever he could to get the, the English Premier League on. Yeah. Uh, and you know, there's, there's always been attention to detail with the food there. Uh, just, it's a, it's a lot of his heritage. His, his family makes Scottish style food. So, well, well, now, I mean, I'm sorry to be tangential. Do you know when it opened? 1999. 1999. January 25th, 1999 to be 
Specific. Okay, I like that. I like that specificity. Uh, now, it, was it the same owner? Yeah. And and it, it. I mean, like, why is it? Why is it a soccer pub? Like, like, where is he just real into soccer? No, I, it's it's. He opened this pub, wanted to be a Scottish pub, a British okay. pub. You know, there's a, we had a we have a huge selection of Scotch whiskey. Uh, you know, more more imported beers and local beers at the time. Uh, and you know, as he's doing this and he's making he's making uh, British style food. Uh, some of the locals and British people like we should put soccer on them. Is he British? Is is a uh, like second generation? Oh, okay, okay, second yeah. generation Scottish. Well, I just didn't know if he moved over here from that no, into Pittsburgh no, and no. just He's decided. Born and raised <laughs> in Regent Square, you know. <laughs> Even better. Yeah. So I mean, uh, I mean, I I definitely have been there before. I've had the shepherd's pie before. It was a Ven- venison's shepherd's pie. This was years ago though. Yep. But uh, I've had boxies there. Fantastic food. So. Yeah. I mean, where does where does his uh, attention to detail come with the food? Like, is that just was that always part of it? Yeah, I mean, it's that's that's what a restaurant is: attention to detail with the food. I mean, you know, not you, all restaurants, though. Well, there, there's a reason that we've been around 25 years. That's fair. You know, it's, it, it's we're in the south side, and it's it's a touristy area, and people pull up the high plates like Piper's Pub. What's that? I'm like British style pub. When did you open? January 25th, 1999. <laughs> That's a long time. Like, well, you don't survive, you know. Yeah. You know, like, is the food any good? I'm like, you don't survive if the food's not good. Yeah. You know, if your whole thing is just uh, we're gonna we're gonna serve chicken wings and Miller Lite and Fireball, you can, you can get that anywhere. Yeah. So wh- how how are you gonna stand out? Especially yeah. in the South Side, how are you gonna stand out in the South Side? Yeah, that makes. In 2010, when there's a uh, 80 some liquor licenses on that street. What are you going to do? How are you going to last five years down here? Yeah, it was bumping. Yeah. It was bumping for sure. Were you a frequent at Southside? Uh, again, I worked in the industry, so I was never out with regularity. Yeah. But, you know, in, in the in the aughts, there was this whole thing. You go to Fat Heads, you get a couple of beers of Fat Heads, you get some food at uh, Piper's Pub, and then you get down to Smoke and Joe's to finish the night. Okay. You know, like the, the old school beer guys, that's what we do. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is new lore to me, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm learning yeah. the new lore of all yeah. this. Uh, I become like fascinated with Southside, like more than, uh, probably any neighborhood. I, I, I have a buddy who lives down there. He asked me to start working with him on like some documentary, but you know, just about like Southside in general, but I've had the chance to, you know, interview some people down there, talk to them just about the community and everything. And it's, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty great place. Uh, it's, it's interesting now the climate of it all because I know that you guys went. How long were you closed? Three years. Now, I mean, in your from 2010 to 2020, uh, what is like the growth of the pub? Like, was it was it? I mean, like, I know it's a hard question, but like, whenever Ian's open, were Ian's popular? I mean, I didn't I didn't start till eleven well, I, years after. That. I know that but, but, when I started in 2010, it was. It was unbelievably busy on the weekends. Okay, so at uh, that point, but but yeah. do, but do you know if whenever he opened, like, was it like a popular place in the yeah, beginning? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Because he was doing a lot of music, and I know it's tiny in there, but in the front area, they do like an acoustical thing every on the weekends. Oh, okay. Uh, and you know, acoustical music was different in two thousand three, two thousand four. You know, and just you know, you could still smoke in bars then. Every, everything was completely different. Yeah, you know, wild the, west. The, the hard, the, it's hard to imagine that place. The first time I went in there, 2003, to where it is now. Like, yeah. It's not the same place. Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, I'm, like, the last of the age to remember, like, you know, I remember vividly, like, the smoking section at Eaton Park. Yeah. You know, going in and after church, you know, were yeah. you smoking or non-smoking. Uh, yeah, and, and the, the division is just one table. Yeah, like, the table literally. Next to you smoking, literally you're smoking, literally the non-smoking <laughs> section. This one table. Yeah. You just see people's cigar smoke, like, billowing yeah. over. Uh, hilarious. So, I mean, 2010, it was busting whenever you were there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is it... Is there is there soccer games every weekend? Like people there every weekend watching soccer? Yeah. I mean they so so his he just finds all the games. All the games are on there. Yep. Okay. And I mean, the food, how much does the menu change in that ten years? Does it always change? Yeah, there's always an evolution. Okay. Uh I, I mean it changed uh you know, the the original menu versus two thousand ten versus where we were twenty fifteen, twenty sixteen. Twenty fifteen, twenty sixteen 2015, 2016 it was big because we thought uh, the mentality there was we need to do something more than just shepherd's pie. Uh, and that was, you know, there's an era of big menus everywhere. Everyone's doing big yeah. huge menus. So we're back down to like a more focused, um, I likened it the other day, like does anybody actually own an Eagles album? 
Like everybody has the Eagles best of, right? That's, that's a good that's, point. We're just playing the best of right now. That's a good point. I you like know? that. That's a good analogy. You know, like <laughs> we could do all these things we used to. We used to have like a, a shepherd's meatloaf on there, and it's like fine. It was great, but you know what? We with the with the whole economy of restaurants right now, we can't afford yeah. to do all these prep. We can't afford to prep seventy two items. On yeah. The menu. It's uh, I feel like that that's something that I never appreciated until I started interviewing like uh, chefs and uh, and and restaurant owners mm -hmm. and uh, watching Gordon Ramsay. You know, he would get these long menus that have like eight pages. He was like, "Why do why is there eight of these right. different pages?" Uh, which makes a lot of sense, but I feel like that not everyone understands that the reasoning behind it, like right. honing honing in on a smaller menu. But uh, that's interesting. I, I mean, when when you're there and you're like watching this like kind of change, is it just does it have any like peaks and valleys or is it kind of always just consistently busy down there because my what i gather from it uh my i have a boss uh he uh i mean he's 73 74 he goes he still goes he's he was pumped whenever it opened back up uh they have always went since the south side and like i hear them talk about it but i just don't know if that's like you know people that loved it or if it was gen like like across the boards like you know was it always just busy because they're always there whenever the games are on so right. they're always telling me it's insane right and you know it depends on the match too yeah uh you know we were this summer we had the euro which is like all the national teams in europe playing a, a tournament and you know the 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 sort of playing games are kind of busy. The knockout games get a little bit busy, and then the the final was Spain. Eight, eight days ago, Spain England. Yeah, uh, and we were you know packed to capacity for four hours. Wow! So how many people could fit in there? Uh, legally, one hundred and twenty. <laughs> <laughs> so so I mean, you becoming a bartender there to to you know what what's your title now? What would you say? I think I'm the GM. GM? I think I am. I'm, yeah. the, I'm like effectively the only manager there right now. Okay. So, so I mean, how does that evolution take place? Like, how do you go from a bartender to getting more involved? I mean, when I started bartending there, Drew's a very hands-on person. He wants to know why we're doing this, how we're doing this. And I, you know, he, one of the reasons he brought me in, he's like, you have a, you have a, a pulse on uh, what beer sells. And he's like, so, you know, he, we have 24 drafts. Tell me some things you want to put on. So I started telling some things to one put on. Then he's like, you're better at this than me. The draft was yours. You figured out. Uh, and then he added 12 more lines. So we had 36 lines of beer. And Is that a lot of pressure for you? I'm sorry to be tangential. No, I love it. It's uh, like okay. that, it's a, that, that plays to my ADHD is organizing a, a beer cool. I think you know? like Zach Galifianakis in the casino with all the numbers like mm, running around. Kind of, yeah. But like, like how do you – so, I mean – how do you like uh, balance it? Like how, I mean, is it just over time you understand what sells at a place like that, you know, at Piper's, yeah. uh, you know, so now you kind of have a good, a good feel on it. But in the beginning, you know, was it like a learning curve? No, cause you know, you, you pick it up real quick. Yeah. You bring in a keg of beer, it sells in four days. People love that. Yeah. You bring in a keg of beer, it sells in three weeks. Like, people hate that. Well, the so reason I even ask that is it's, I feel like it's overwhelming. The, the basis of my question is I feel like we live in like, like this world of saturation where there's just so much shit to pick from. Right. So it's like, you know, like, how do you hone in on what you do? Uh, like I said, the, the classics. Yeah. So we have like six, six to eight. And we, we only have 12 faucets right now. So half of them are the classics. There's Guinness, there's Old Speckled Head, there's Fuller's, there's Bellhaven. Okay. Like a couple of those we have to have. Like I put it on my chest. We always have Guinness. We always have Bellhaven, which is a Scottish ale or the Scottish pub. Okay. Uh, we always have a cider on. It's either Strongbow or Magners, both imported, British. So th th these are the easy ones. And then it's like, okay, we need to have an IPA or two. I'm only going to buy those from people I know. Yeah. You know, it's, it's rare for me to buy a... a, a an IPA from Chicago. Yeah, for sure. I get that. Uh, when there's so many local ones made. We're like, spoiled well, here. Well, yeah, but again, you know, if you're going to give $250 to somebody, it's it's a, it's a lot nicer to give it to somebody you know. Yeah. Rather than just like, here, two, throw $250 across the country. You're just investing in the thing that you love. Right. That's what it is. Right. So, I mean, that, that's interesting. You have like, uh, you said you have them like, you know, the main six of those. Those are just like, you know, I'm, I'm not a beer drinker. So are those like the ones... Those are the ones that you could, you know, that people are always getting no matter what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you, and a, a lot of that also is indoctrination of the staff. Yeah. You know, so I'll bring in something new and, you know, I know what it is. I know the history because, again, I, I like somebody dubbed me the Rain Man of beer once. I just have this knowledge of all these beers from working at Sharp Edge. We had a catalog of 400 different labels. Yeah. And you had to train staff. So, you know, here's, here's three quick words to describe a beer. Mm. You know, 
is it light? Is it dark? Is it bitter? Is it sweet? Uh, and uh, I think that pretty much covers it. But you know, <laughs> you, you can you, you get a few descriptors that people recognize, and then they can they can expand their knowledge from there. But you know, indoctrination of the staff is sort of that thing. Like, hey, I brought in this beer, promised by six kegs of it. Here's what it is. Tastes good. Go sell it to you know here. Somebody who usually drinks Yingling, sell them Bellhaven. Somebody who usually drinks uh, once a Miller Lite, try to sell one Einbecker. Hmm. And next thing you know, the staff is like, this works. Let's, and then you're selling. What's your choice? Depends on the day. Are you, are you like a, you're, you're just all over the place sometimes? Yeah. yeah. What about those core six that you mentioned, like the, the, the Guinness and all that? Like, what do you yeah. usually go with? I'll drink a Guinness at least once a week. Yeah. Because you know you 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 hand you you see thirty of them go across your your bar top there, yeah. and you're like, man, that looks good. <laughs> I have one of those when I sit down tonight. Uh, <laughs> Einbecker's is a, a brand I forced into fruition. It's a German pilsner. Uh, we sell almost as much of that as we do Guinness now, huh. which is weird at the Scottish pub. But it's uh, again, I, I tell people like if they, somebody's like, I don't know if uh, what kind of beer I want, they're like, well, why don't you have an Einbecker while you think about what kind of beer you want? Yeah, it's sort of like. Again, indoctrinated the staff and to just give people in there. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's it's interesting to hear how that all kind of unfolds. Yeah. Now, I mean, you guys coming up on to 2020, obviously, uh, COVID, hmm. you know, the the left swing from in the back. Yeah. Uh, shuts in down then. Yeah. Is that whenever it shuts down? Yeah. So why does it take three years to, to get back? Because this is where I started to come uh, to my, where you started to come to my attention. Yeah. Uh, you always tweeted, I do not know when Piper's right. is going to open back up. And I didn't know your backstory at all. Right. My sister-in-law obviously knows you and uh, is cool with you and all them. So I would, I would ask her, I would ask her, I, you know, because well, story. I, yeah, yeah, I'm just, I'm curious right. about it because I always see you say it and I'm sure that there was a lot of other people that were berating you because you would have some insider information but right. now that i know your background i understand why that was happening right so i mean why does that take three years i mean it, we had a he had drew had one-on-one -on -one meetings with everyone on staff the week of that shutdown and you know basically sat down with everyone and was like this is going to last longer than three weeks are you financially solvent enough that this is not going to destroy you and you know basically said some people are going on hiatus some people are continue working we'll find work for people so he handled that initial part really really well uh and then he started doing these little projects and again he was he he, he had immunocompromised people in his immediate family so he took it very seriously didn't want to be open didn't want you know even the chip shop next door was yeah take out only couldn't even get in the front door so he took it very seriously and he started doing these projects you know he, he replaced the entire floor behind the bar, replaced almost the entire electrical system in the pub, replaced almost the entire plumbing system, redid the entire kitchen. And he did these all sort of by hand. But when you walk in the, you know, if you, if you didn't know any, you, you walk in there and like, all he did was paint. And I'm like, no, he, that's not what he did. So yeah. he took on all these projects and uh, I know Drew well because he is me. He took on all these projects and never finished any of them. So there's even still a few, a few projects hanging in the midst that he just never <laughs> kind of got to. But How old is this guy? He's 10 years older than me, so okay. 56 or okay. so. Uh, but, I mean, that's why the pub took so long to go, because he took on all these projects, didn't want any help from anyone, while he's also still trying to keep the chip shop open. And yeah. Just, when does that open? Chip shop? Yeah. Uh, was it 2015? Okay. 2014? Now, why does that open? The chip shop opened because Piper's Pub couldn't sell enough fried fish out of the fryers we had there. Oh, so shit. They opened up a takeout spot next door so they could just pretty much sell even more fried fish. Wow. So that's and then interesting. The, pa the passion was also meat pies, like British style meat pies, uh, which we're selling a lot of now because we put them on the menu at the pub as well. So. Wow. So the chip shop was kind of like your, uh, you know, uh, I mean, that, that's like the savior. Yeah, the like, pandemic, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So that kind of was what was kept everything running. Yeah. Wow. All while this guy's trying to fix everything on the inside. Yep. Now, what was the, I mean, like, what was the motivation of, like, kind of keeping everyone in the dark and rather not just saying, like, yo, I'm fucking fixing shit? I mean, no, no one, I no feel one like, asked him. Everyone asked me. Yeah. You know, I, I, well, you, that's what I mean. So, my wife worked at Piper's for a long time, too. She left right before, she left in, like, December 19 to go start a catering business. Okay. So whenever the pandemic hits, Drew's like, are you solvent enough? I'm like, yeah, I can, I can fuck off. I can do something else. Yeah. 
So I started working with my wife doing catering. We took on a spot in Sharpsburg and we built out a catering kitchen and the little pop-up we had Mindy's taking. Best, best potato pancake I've ever had in my entire life. And do you hear that? I'm, I'm, <laughs> and that's no exaggeration. Best potato oh, pancake yeah, I've ever for, had. For, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm that hip made, to it. Yeah. I, I had one of the 75,000 that were at Marissa's. That's what she ordered, man. <laughs> yeah, that I, was know, so good. I, we're not here to tell people. She was like, take yeah. as many as you want home. I ordered way too many. Yeah. I was like, all right. Yeah. Uh, but so so she, I mean, worked there with the kitchen, and then you guys opened that uh, take or that takeout spot. Yeah. And and I mean, are, what's your what's your level of cooking? Are you a cook? Or are I'm you? a hack. Okay, I'm a cook. Like I, I you, can't, you can I, get in there. I and can, happen. You hand me a recipe, I'm, I'll I'll make it happen. Okay. Uh, creation of menu items, things like that. I'm not as good. I have a I have a, my wife is excellent. At that. Yeah. So a lot of times they're like, how do I get from here? To here, and yeah. she's like, "Well, here's the roadmap." I'm like, "Oh, perfect." Thing. Yeah, and you're a good soldier. You can right. follow directions. Right. right, that's good. You know, I'm, I, I take direction well. I, I, I learn. I put put my hands on things and figure it out. Yeah. Know? Well, so what happens with the take and bake? Uh, what happened with it, like in the past year? Yeah, I mean, because it's not, it's no longer, right? Right. We don't so, have to get into it if you don't want nah, to. We, we, you know, we were doing a lot of a, a, a production catering, uh, TV sets, uh, commercial shoots, things like oh, that. Oh, really? So the the strike last year, the the SAG after strike, uh, so everything bumped down. All the catering companies that were at the top level bumped down a level, and we were bottom feeders already. Oh, wait. so we lost a lot of revenue every month. Oh, okay, like, I get it now. So it whenever was, you guys opened up, that was like a main one of your main people. Yeah. How do you how did you get in with that? Whenever Mindy left, she was partnered with somebody that was in, involved with that. So we had a lot of contacts there. And yeah. Then, you know, the, the, way, the way you improve on anything, you deliver, you're on time, you make good food for the oh, place, yeah. and you're on time. If you make good food and you're on time, there ain't nothing else you could worry right. about. Right. You meet anyone cool while you were doing that? No. no. I mean, a, a lot of it, you're most most dealing with a, a, a yeah, production the, assistants. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I didn't know if Jeremy like Renner popped up like, yeah, these potato pancakes are pretty good. No, I don't think we have anything like that. Rick Seaback, you know, but I mean. Classic. Uh, so, I mean, like, in that time, you guys are obviously not working at, I mean, you're not working at Piper's. Right. You're, you're working there. I mean, what it, do you have any idea, any bearing? Like, is, the, is Drew, like, telling you what's up? Or you kind of, you just don't there's, know. There's a long, sorted tale there. Like, okay. I was in contact with them for a long time. But as we're running this, you know, uh, we're, we're blocking halfway from Dancing Gnome. Obviously, I'm involved with the beer community. So that's where that whole thing came from, is that, like, three times a week, I'd hear Dancing Gnome customers come in. What's going on with Pipers? I'm like, oh, okay, I don't yeah. know, man. You were the guy. And so I, everyone I did kind of know, but it was like, I, there's no timetable. I like, get what you're saying. Gonna, he's going to reopen whenever he feels comfortable to reopen. I don't yeah. know how long after... His third shot, or whatever, whatever it may be, I don't know how deep he is into it. So when when did it open? It reopened fourteen months ago. Fourteen Wait, months, 14, ago. 16 months ago. But but it opened limited hours, right? Yeah. And and what was the what were those? Like wasn't I, it? I didn't come back till about six months ago. Six months ago? Yeah. I didn't know all this. Yeah. So six months. I mean, how do you get back? How do you find your way back here? Oh man. There was a falling out. Like, I, I can't lie. Like, you know, there was a couple text messages between Drew and I uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, when I was like, you're fucking this up. You are fucking this up so fucking bad. And he's like, well, you got your own shit to worry about. Don't worry about me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously there's people that I work with at Piper's and, you know, still kept in contact with them. You see them once a week. I'm like, e, what's going on? How's, how's my boy Drew? He's like, you don't want to talk about it. I was like, okay. And then... You know, they're open for like a year with weird hours. Basically, they're open like Thursday night, Friday night, and then Saturday, Sunday. For I remember soccer. seeing random hours. Right. Like four to nine, Friday, Thursday and Friday, and then like 10 to four. Was the kitchen Saturday. open? Kitchen was open. Okay, yeah. Kitchen was barely open because he couldn't find staff. Okay. So uh, the longtime bartender, Brian, <clears throat> left in December of 2023. And I was like, that's not good. Like, that's Brian was pretty much driving everything at Piper's at the time. That dude was there for a while. Yeah, he, he predates me. He started, I think, in 2003 or uh, 2004. So you saw the wake 
of like what was happening. Yeah. All these people that were like staples, like right. obviously jumping ship. You're like, right. what the fuck is going well, I mean, on? And to be fair, Brian opened up his own place. Yeah, like he he got his team together, opened his own spot, the pitch on Butler, and he's doing great. But whenever that happened, whenever he left, I was like, oh man, this is gonna be fucked. Yeah. And you know, Eric Biggie's like, you, you need to talk to Drew. And I was like, Drew needs to talk to me. He said some shit to me. Yeah. Um, he's got to reach out to me. So next day, I get a text like, I hear I need to talk to you. So that's good. Spent like three, you know, I had a meeting with Drew last four hours because you got to talk about the state of the South Side, the state of this, this. We got to talk about this. We got to talk about everything. Just the way Drew operates. Yeah. So there were like four meetings. You know, I'm working at Necromancer at the time, just DDTing that place into the ground. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I didn't know that you worked there. Yeah. So okay. we had Mindy and I left. Uh, we folded up Mindy's because we were losing the money. Oh, shit. And, like, Lauren, the head brewer at Necromancer, kind of knew I was unhappy, and she's like, okay, you can come. We're what gonna- was that called? The Naked Whistler or something? The, the, uh, what's it? Midnight Whistler. Midnight yeah. Whistler. The, uh, old, the old Huff's building. Yeah. I forgot that that was yeah. a thing. Okay. So we did that, and, like, it, the reason I the reason I it, Drew reached out to me, knew, that, like, this is going sideways. This is like, this is so sideways. It's so bad. Yeah. And, you know, I got out, well, I got out before the free beer of Palooza they hosted up in North <laughs> that Hills. That was fucking crazy. My wife was working that, and I was like, I'm so sorry. She's like, what can I do? Oh, my God. I remember seeing a, uh, I remember seeing that post. It was like, yeah, you'll get a case or come and get some free beer. Yeah. But I did not expect it to be like that. I mean, come on. This is Pittsburgh. <sighs> I mean, I you guess, know, but like, if that was. there's free beer, you think there's not going to be 500 yinzers going out? Like that's a good free. point. Good point. Good point. You so, know. I mean, like, whenever that happens, and obviously all that shit comes crashing down, what happens? With Necro? No, oh, well, I mean, uh, we all know what happened with that. Yeah. That that shuts down, obviously. But, like, what happens with you after that? And, I mean, obviously. I mean, I bounced out before it all came crashing down. Yeah. Uh, and I was, at, I was at Piper's by then, and just, I started. You know, January 25th, 2024 is our first day back. That was their 25th anniversary. No and shit. And I was like, you know, I, there's a reason that number sticks in my head, you know? So I come back and like, we're talking about this leading up and it was like the turn, you know, it, it's New Year and I'm like, all right, I'll be back. And we're trying to figure out logistics and I'm like, I'll start the week after, but I'll be, I'll be down there for Burns Night to sort of stage and the next few days afterwards. For what night? Burns Night. What's uh, that? January 25th. Oh, okay. It's a, a birthday of a, a Bobby Burns, Scottish poet. Ah. Uh-huh. But it's a big Scottish holiday. We so make, that's a thing We make haggis, there. we drink whiskey, we, we drink Bellhaven. Oh, wow. See, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. So January 25th down January at Piper's 25th. is fucking wild. Yeah. Okay. It's not wild. It's, it's always low key. Yeah. You know, we're not bringing bagpipers in there because that building is an echo chamber. You're not bringing no bagpipes in there? Fuck bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to buy a set, but I knew that it would just... T- dust collect dust i mean even if you're bad at it you're still good i know you right? know just sitting there even I, if you're good at it, my you're wife still would bad. divorce me a hundred percent dog would be gone too uh but i mean so you go back there and like you know whenever you get back there what's the state of you know pipers because right now uh my my boss and everything they say nothing but but great things mm-hmm. i've heard nothing but great things right uh so i mean like it you're whenever you go back there what's the state of it functional Functional, barely a little bit. You had something to work with. Yeah, there was. You know, we were only open. You know, what thirty hours a week or something. Yeah. Not even that. You know, five, ten, twenty hours a week. We're only open twenty hours a week. So you know, that's it, whatever systems were in place. We're there just for that, and I was like, we can't keep doing this. Like, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, if you're gonna continue to pay me what you're paying me for all this, we're yeah. gonna have to get back to a more real, a, 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 a sort of reality. So that was. You know, like, let's let's bring in some staff. We're going to lose some money, Drew. He's like, I know. I'm like, oh, we're going to lose some money for six months. Like, to to sort of, like, raise this Titanic from the fucking dead. Yeah. Bring it back to something resembling what it was in, in 2018. We're going to have to, you're going to have to sink some money. You're going to have to lose some money on training people and bring people in. And This is to, January. Yeah, January, February. Okay. So, so it, was, it was sort of like a, you know, a... a a struggle to get to, you know, I, I had all these little steps planned out. Like, yeah. okay, we have to be open for dinner service on the weekends by parade day. Have to. What day is that? Uh, it's was, it was always a Saturday before. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I can't remember what day it was yeah. specifically, but I was like, we have to be open for dinner service that Saturday night. We can't fucking close at four o'clock on parade day, even if it's even if it's bunk. We're gonna we're gonna have a security guard. We're gonna do everything right. If it's if it's banging, if it's like twenty thirteen, is it usually people, banging? Parade day was. 
Okay. 15, 15 years ago it was. That's one thing I've never done. I never went to the I'm yeah. I've never went to the city for it. Like I said, 15 years ago you go to the city, you you, you know, <laughs> the attitude at the time was you go out Friday night, hammer it all night long, drink all night long Friday night. Yeah. Roll down to the the, the parade downtown at 7 a.m. Little hair of the dog. Keep rolling all the way through, <laughs> and then you end up on the south side at like 11 a.m. noon and just keep... Keep the Jeep riding. And then like 2 o'clock, you pass out for a couple hours, come back out at 10 o'clock. Wow. And it was... Parade day was a, a wall of humanity for years. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, starting about 2018, 2019, it's sort of tapered off because there's other places to go besides Southside. Yeah, for sure. And that's like the, the circle of life, you know, the strip district used to be the place to go. And then it was, uh, so station square was the place to go. And it was Southside for a couple of years. And now it's not like parade day was parade day this year was, was boring. Really? You know, yeah. and it wasn't like, okay, we just opened up. This is like our second Saturday open in five you just felt years. The, felt the energy was you different. You walk down the street and you're like, man, everybody is geared up. You know, this place has five security guards outside and there's <laughs> no line to get in. These guys, yeah, everyone's just texting like fucking bullshit. This is boring. Southside's you know? in a weird, it's in a weird spot right now. Always is. It's always in a weird spot, but it's even worse now because you got these fucking jackasses with platforms that are just like only highlighting. I feel like that the only thing you see in, in the media is just negative shit and uh just like i was talking to austin and any other you know south side business owner that i spoke with it's like you know all these people have nothing but great things to say about the just the community the area in general yeah. but then you have like these like you know those few months back then whenever all that crazy shit's happening and it just keeps rolling the snowball keeps getting bigger and bigger because you have these like you know media people focusing on on it right which is ridiculous it pisses I mean, it's, me off it's it's a, it even when it was busy as hell, even when it was shooty last summer, it's still like the most walkable neighborhood in the city. Yeah. You can walk downtown. Yeah. You can walk down the station square, cross over the Smithfield Street Bridge, you're downtown. Have like, you ever like felt that. unsafe there? Have I ever felt unsafe? Yeah. In Granted, the you're a big ass dude, but like. Yeah, and no, that's, I, I recognize. I don't feel like a big ass dude, yeah. but you know, I. Yeah, I, but if I, I want to kidnap if, you, if it's going to be hard. If I dad voice in that pub, yeah. it's like the whole place stops. So. <laughs> I would be intimidated by you if you uh, get loud like that. Yeah. Yeah, you got to, right? You got to have, have a handle to. on these people. Well, yeah, you need. Sometimes people need. You need to handle it. You're, you, sometimes you got to elk crazy somebody. I know. You're <laughs> dealing with all these drunk people, too. Some, the drunk people are rarely the problem. It's It's the. It's always the suburbanites. Yeah, and I'm a sur suburbanite too. But you know, like I, I your your boots on the ground though. Yeah, so yeah. I, 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 unsafe. I don't know. There's there's always there there used to be characters. Yeah, that just gave you a bad vibe. But nothing that's crazy nothing. that's sticking off of your mind. And I feel like that I've asked this question to all these different people, and yeah. everyone's like, no, you know. And I know that there is fucked up stuff that will happen down there every once in a while. It's but it's a, like it's a city. few like, and far between. You deal with like a couple thousand people in one neighborhood. Absolutely. There's there, no one's ever going to be in agreement on anything. And there's always just somebody like, oh, maybe today's day he stands on the the corner and yells about it. I agree with you there. So I mean, you're I mean from January until. You know, we're mid-July right now. Mm -hmm. uh, your tweet, the one of your tweets was a picture that was just packed, and it says, Piper's is fucking back. Yeah. Now, when does that feeling come in to you? When, when Piper's is back? Yeah. Honestly, like, Sundays are exhausting, because it's the end of a long week, and Sundays always have been uh, a good neighborhood day. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's uh, we, we do a good brunch business, but all afternoon, it's a lot of the locals, a lot of the service industry people from Southside coming in. So, you know, so much of the, so much of the job in a restaurant is being a social butterfly. Just, you know, I'm, I'm opening up this place. For sure. Come see me. Yeah, absolutely. So Sundays are fucking rewarding. And that's usually when that happens. I'm like, fucking, we did it another week, man. We're, we're making this happen. Yeah. So, I, I mean, to say it's back... Oh, it's still not. Again, it's not 2018, but we're on the track. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we look at numbers from like, you know, I, I again, I, I have these little little stretch goals I set for myself, and I'm like, well, you know, I'm hitting October's goals now. So. Oh, yeah. So, I don't know. You know, whenever I hit you up, I, I was, I honestly thought that this wasn't going to happen. I just didn't see you as someone that would want to come and talk about all this stuff on this podcast. I asked Marissa, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, I feel like if I ask him to talk to me, he's, he's just going to leave me on red or something. But, uh, I, I mean, you know, that was me making an assumption, but like your whole, I mean, like, 
I know this is a weird question, but what is your motivation to come on here and talk about pipers? You know, like, I mean, like, obviously it's a place that you're passionate about. You spent a lot of years there, right. but for you to go back there and like, you know, try to, you know, re-steer the ship, uh, you know, where does that come from? I mean, what made you, what made you want to go back there and not just find another fucking job somewhere else? It's like I never left there. Like, I, it, the the entire pandemic time, I was kind of like, you know, in the back of my head, I'm going back there at some point. And yeah. then when it didn't happen, that's, again, the sort of breakup we had. Yeah. And, you know, that sucked. Because, you know, even even in 2022, when I'm doing my own thing, I'm like, man, it'd be great back get back to old times, you know? Yeah. So, uh, and then, you know, I, I, you, ever, you ever left a job and have to go back in that building? And you're like, man, I fucking hated everything about this. So my first... At, you know, January 25th, 2024, we're back in that building. I'm like, man, I might die in this building, aren't I? <laughs> it's like all these little bumps in the floor. You know, it's a... It's a, it's a you know two, every... Two, you know, I know every one of them. I'm like, I'm going to die in this building. I'm going to be a bump right there, right <laughs> next to table eight. That's going to be me. You're going to trip over me. Have it's you ever seen any weird day. weird shit in there? Any ghosts or anything no, like that? Not, not there. Nothing like that? No. Are you a ghost guy? Yeah. I've seen some shit. Like when, what? I, when I worked at the Sharp Edge and Crafton, it was an old house, right? Oh yeah, that and place there's, is wild. There's a there's always a reflection if you stand outside. I don't know if you could still do that with the caliente, but there's a if you stood outside the front door there, which is where we used to smoke, let's say kicked out smoking, and you could stand there at night and you could see this sort of silhouette coming off the walls with the the shadows, and it looked like Homer Simpson was be, was hanging, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, it's a shadow of a dead guy. I'm like, no, no person is actually shaped like Homer Simpson. The you know? least intimidating ghost ever. <laughs> and there was like a whole thing, uh, a coworker of mine, did, the office was in the top floor, like base of the attic. Like I came in one day and all the chairs were arranged in a circle. And I'm like, that could have been the asshole that closed the night before. It could yeah, be something real. It's strange. I love a good practical joke. So the one thing I saw there was closing one night. And, you know, the ice bucket sit on a sort of a shelf next to the ice machine. You're talking about Sharp Edge? Yeah. And I go down there, and like both ice buckets are on the ground. I'm like, that's fucking weird. Who who didn't put the ice buckets back on the shelf? So I put them back on the shelf, walk around the corner, and I hear one of the buckets hit the ground. No. I'm like, what the fuck? Turn around, the other one's in the air, and I'm like, that's your problem. I'm getting the hell out of here. Yeah, I'd be gone. So I, I you know. <laughs> Well, I mean, like, I know you said you had your, uh, I know you said you had your, like, small goals that you're working towards, but, like, as a whole of Piper's Pub, like, is there goals, you know, that you guys are trying to yeah. make happen right now? Like, yeah. what are your goals with this? Uh, seven days a week. So, what we're, is it right we're, now? We're open Wednesday through Sunday, uh, lunch and dinner. So, 1130 to 10, 1130 to 11, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, open for brunch, 10 a.m., Saturday and Sunday, kitchen till 11. And the kitchen till 11 was a, a stretch thing for me, too. Because I can't, uh, I can't sit at home on my couch and go. It's fucking bullshit that nobody's open to eleven anymore. When I'm Without running, when I'm running a kitchen in a, in an entertainment district, yeah, with a lot of neighbors. Yeah, I mean, so, so that was that was our bread and butter years ago. Those people, I can get a fucking scotch egg at ten thirty on a Wednesday and a pint of beer. Like, whew, this is dangerous. Wow. So, how, I mean, like, would you? How many businesses down there are open that late? Because I see it on like uh, I've seen Reddit posts about people saying like it's bullshit. We can't get anything, right. you know, past ten o'clock. Right. I mean, is that pretty much, the, you know, the same way it is down, you know, through the duration of Southside? I, I think there's a couple, you know, Dive. Yeah. I, I think Dive's open. I think OTB is only until 10. I don't know. I really don't know. I'm, yeah. out, I'm out of touch. Like, I'm, I've been... I've been in the South Side a lot, but I've been in my four yeah, walls in, a lot. And I need, you know, I need to go back out and meet all the people I used to know 15 years ago. Well, that's interesting to think about that. Like, that's like one of the things that you're like working towards is like, you want to be open late and you want to be open. You want, you want people to have the resource to be able to get this right. stuff. You know, it got to be there for people to want to be able to buy right. it. Uh, that's and, interesting. And consistency is also the thing, you know, we, the, this is something we, I've industry drew and I've talked about before. Like if you say you're open to 11, and then, you know, you have a slow night and you close at 1030. Guess what? You're only up until 1030 from now on. You know, yeah. like once you've given up that ghost, it's over. So you got to, you got to you know, pick a time, stick to it and commit to it. So it could take, it could take a year before people were like, oh, they're, I know they're open until 11. But, you know, I, I could say that, but also I know that I took uh, six months of putting a, putting my hands on social media and, you know, telling people when Piper's Pub was opening and getting a consistent thing. And it works because we took like a social media break for a week and didn't post anything. We still had people come in for lunch, yeah. which we, you know, we only started serving lunch a month ago, a month and a half ago. So to have people just pulling the door organically means, well, something worked, you know, like you're not yeah. going to, 
if you know the history of Piper's Pub in the past four years, like, I don't know when the fuck they're open. And now you just know, like, oh, I know they're open. I'll come in. Oh, yeah. So... What's uh like? What's people's like? You know, feeling whenever like 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 like. Do you have like locals that you see now that are just like pumped? Yeah, I mean, there got to be right. There's a lot of locals. I mean, it's Piper's Pub has always been about a lot of locals. Yeah, uh, there's you know, I'd say five tables a day. It's our first time in here since since the pandemic. So glad you finally reopened. And it's like oh, we're open for sixteen months. You know, <laughs> eighteen months now. <laughs> Like that kind of it kind of burns, but at least like oh, good. I'm I'm seeing five tables a day for the first time again. Yeah. So now you gotta you gotta give them the old razzle dazzle, make well, them come back. I mean, like Piper's is obviously return, return customers are where it's at. You know, like it's really easy, and this goes back to like the Miller Lite and Fireball. Like it's really easy to bring in a customer once. How do you bring that customer back once a week? Yeah. You know, I love that. That's a good point, though. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, you. Like like your focus as far as or as far as your customer base now, obviously Piper's has an established name. You know it's it's open and stuff like that. But as a business, uh, do you guys focus a lot on social media? We used to focus harder. For yeah, sure. Like we used to, you know, we we used to run a, a, a lunch special and a dinner special every day. And half the reason for that was at eleven thirty every day we're telling you we're open, and at four o'clock every day we're telling you we're open. Uh, I you know, social media isn't where it was in 2016. You yeah. know, as much as we're all glued to our phones now, we're not glued to it in that same kind of way. Yeah, it's over. There, I mean, like there's there's too much to look at now right. almost. So you know, uh, social media is definitely important. Uh, you know, I, I've I've watched. Uh, I don't know if you know Trace Brewing Company and Adam Storm at all. Oh yeah, I've I interviewed take, him on here. I take you've interviewed him. Oh yeah, Good fantastic guy. guy. I've, I've taken a lot of notes from him. Just yeah. how he treats social media and how he creates a vibe for Trace. A vibe is the is the most right. perfect way right. to say it. I mean, it's it's not that like cookie cutter like 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 just black and white like very stale right. type of thing. It has a vibe to it. Right. Got to you. Got to be remain positive. You can't be talking about parking. Can't be talking. You just here's what we do well. Don't talk about what you're never going to fix this outside. Whatever is wrong with this outside, our two storefronts are never going to be the solution. Yeah. So we're just going to you know stick our feet in the ground, and you know there have been places that have existed in horrible locations before. And not to say Southside's horrible, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While everyone's saying it's so bad down here, and I was like, well, have you tried looking within? And trying to prove what you do rather than just blaming it on the curbside. Yeah, so. it's understandable. And uh, that's you know that's our social media too. I you know I, I have to I have to use sort of Drew's breath a little bit in his mind and his his words. Yeah. Also, I can't because he gets a little down. Like, you know, I've been doing this for twenty five years. I know it got to be a it so got to be I got, a beast. I got, I got to try to keep it a little more up tempo than him, but uh, I still don't want to take it over from him. I don't want to be at, you know Hart's voice on Piper's Pub. Yeah. So. I mean, like, uh, I'm a bit of an asshole. So <laughs> <laughs> no, you're a good follow. You're definitely a good follow. I was thinking like, whenever you came here, uh, Hart Johnson and the Piper's pub revival, that sounds like a band name yeah. that you would see in front of like, jug you band. Know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right in front of goose or something like that. Ugh. Uh, but, uh, what was I just going to ask you? Oh, so, I mean, like, what do you do with your free time? Like whenever you're not just like, you know, living in this bar, I mean, like, what do you do? It's been a it's been a long six months. So I don't have much free time. Yeah. Like so, the past last week is the first time I had two days off in a week in probably four months, and today was again. I, I was a slug today. I didn't do anything. I mean, well, that's good. Absolute but like, slug. what other kind of stuff do you enjoy? Uh, uh cycling. I like, uh, you know, you you're right next to the, the Montour Trail here. I was just on here. I did sixty miles on the Montour Trail the other day. Oh yeah. So I, I like that. I used to I used to bike commute to work. Uh, back in the day, from Carnegie to Southside. Wow, which was fun. Yeah, and that's uh, you know, if you're if you're driving to Southside in rush hour traffic, it could take you an hour, hour and twenty minutes. Bike, to get there you some zip days. right through there. Bike, you're thirty eight minutes door to door, never changes. Wow, unless you. Yeah, I mean, you unless, unless you get hit by a car, <laughs> can't hate riding a bike. <laughs> right, some wonderful, wonderful right. Uh, outlet. Right, you go on the trail a lot. Yeah, it's I still in Carnegie, so the the. Uh, Panhandles right there too. Oh uh, yeah, good thing. But good I, point. I, you know, I made a. I'll drive up to the Allegheny River Trail uh, up in up in East Brady. Yeah, it's a favorite trail mine too. So that's awesome. Uh, and other than that, you know, uh, go to a tap room because again, I know a lot of these people in the industry. Uh, you try to hit dancing them once a week. Try to hit thunder once a week. Again, spread that money to my friends. You know, not just the not just run the beer on tap, but support them. Hell yeah. Um, do you think that there's anything that I might have overlooked with talking about Piper's? 
No? I think we did a pretty thorough job, right? We'll be back. You know, we're still not... You know, I say Piper's Pub is back, and it's, it's it, again, raising a Titanic one center block at a time. Like yeah. It, it's at least we're, we're coming back to floating. It's not... Exactly. At pointed, least you're not... It's not pointed down. That's what anymore. I mean. You wouldn't be putting so, that out there if you're yeah, like, this yeah, is yeah, fucked yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, you know, so, I mean, it, you got something to work with. A, a lot of it was like, you know, not just resurrecting the pub and the menu and the, the hours. It was like the mentality of everyone involved. The vibe of it. You know, there were staff members that stayed the entire way through, and, you know, my first week's back, they're just like, they're defeated. How many people were there? I don't know, man. I like, I mean, like, is it is it a big crew? You got 20? We had, you know, between two stores, we had, I think, 40 before pandemic. I guess so. I, uh, I forget whenever I, I forget uh, Pub Chip Shop, too. So, Chip Shop's running about six people right now, total staff. Uh, pub, let's see, eight. it's about 20 total in the pub right now. How many, how long does it take you to clean all them lines? Hour and a half, for for all of them. Yep. Wow, you got it. You got it. It's, only, it's only twelve lines right now. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a little system. You know, you you untap everything, connect everything to a cleaning can, put chemical in it, let the chemical sit for twenty five minutes, flush it with water, put the beer on tap. Do you have any uh, interest on you know furthering your education like formally, or are you just like you know you you you, you learn by. Uh, being there as far as like beer line cleaning or just beer no like beer in general like like isn't there like like uh, what is it what is it called dunning kruger that's what i had what is that uh the 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 less you know the more you think you know dunning kruger dunning kruger that's like uh, the people that have a a little speck of uh, knowledge about one topic and they think they're they think they know everything hell yeah which is where i was years ago over for the sharp edge i thought i knew everything and now it's like i don't know anything i've been doing this for 20 there's almost 30 years now. Yeah. You still brew at home? No. I don't have any time. Yeah, I bet. But it's probably know, just I, a beast. I, you know, I, I I work with Lauren, who was at Necromancer. She's at uh, she's at uh, Two Phrase now. Yeah. Uh, and she has a passion for British-style beers. And, you know, the, when, I, when I worked at Necromancer, I was like, change the malt on this, change these on this, clean it up, make it drier, make it more drinkable. And, you know, the beer that... I, I gave her all those tips on. She entered in a competition last week, and, you know, we had it on tap. And she's like, what do you think it'll do? I was like, it's too good to meddle. Because, you know, if, for a beer to meddle at a competition, it has to stand out. Like, this is just perfect. It fits all the little parameters. And then it wins a, it wins a medal. Did it? Yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah. That's cool. So, I mean, like, you're just you're just fully in it. You're a beer guy. You're just fully in the yeah. world. You yeah, love it's, it. It's, are you like someone that like travels and goes to different breweries and shit like yeah. that all the time? Yeah, I mean, uh, Sharp Edge sent me to Belgium for ten days at one point. Holy shit! Uh, my parents lived in Southern California, so I knew a lot of the Southern California breweries there. My brother-in-law, uh, George. I don't know if you know George. George and Rita. George and Rita. George works for Necromancer. He works for CoStar now. I, he's if I hitchhiker, if I seen he's, it, he's if I seen guy. him, I probably would for sure. They lived in Portland, Oregon for a while. There, oh, so that's I knew cool. a lot of breweries in Portland. My other sister lives in uh, Wisconsin, which of course you know. So you got all funny. sorts of places yeah. to go dip around to. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. All right, uh, well, you're not done yet. So the ending segment that I do with everyone is an ending segment called Desert Island Questions. All right, Desert Island questions whenever I give each guest three categories to take with them on a Desert Island to use until they starve to death and die. First category is three movies. What would your three favorite three movies be? favorite movies. You a movie guy? Yeah. Uh, Scott Pilgrim. Oh, that's so good. Uh, probably Lebowski. I don't know. I saw... Uh, I saw Full Metal Jacket at a formative age, so probably Full Metal Jacket. <laughs> was, I think it was eight years old when I saw yeah. that movie. I know. It's, it, it, it formed I, a lot of opinions about things. Ridiculous. I remember watching, like, you know, Gummo and shit like that whenever you're in, like, you know, the most malleable time in your yeah, mind. And you're yeah. like, I could feel my brain kind of melting <laughs> once he drops that chocolate bar in the bathwater. <laughs> Still grosses me out. Okay, so uh, second category, are you a reader? Yeah. Now, okay, good. I'm glad you said yeah. no. What are your three favorite beers in the city that you're not uh, that you don't have any affiliation with? I guess you don't have any I don't affiliation. affiliation with anyone, yeah. yeah, three favorite beers in the city. Yeah, do you have a favorite? You're talking about beer, Rain Man. Uh, yeah, it's it's, I know, all, it's, it's hard. all time of day. You know, yeah, I know it's hard. Uh, Golden Age in Homestead makes some great lagers. Uh, some of their lagers have been outstanding. Just clean, refreshing, simple beers. Uh, I love uh, Old Thunder. Uh, I think they make some of the best IPAs in the city, uh, and they're up in Blonox. 
Uh, and I said, I worked across the street from Dancing Gnome for four years. I got a lot of love to Dancing Gnome. You know, everybody knows them for their, their ultra hazy IPAs. Yeah. They also make great traditional styles now. So some of their West Coast IPAs, some of my favorites. Okay, that's good. All right, third category, three CDs. Three CDs. So yeah. is, is it got to be like a CD? A, so it has to be like pre twenty sixteen. I'll give you a. Uh, I'll give you a. Uh, I'll give you a greatest hits if you want to. Though I mean, it could be any. Okay, it could so be new a, stuff. An album. Yeah, it could be. Uh, I loved your Eagles analogy. That was so good. <laughs> that was so good. Where we are, man. Yeah. Uh, failure. Fantastic Planet. Uh, Mid nineties sort of space grunge. Uh, space grunge. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever listened to it. Yeah. Okay. I saw them open for a techno band in the mid nineties in Colorado, and I was like, "These guys rock!" <laughs> and then they had like one hit and kind of went away. And they've reformed. I've seen them a couple times. Put on a good show. That's cool. CDs, CDs. Uh, Soundgarden, Bad Motorfinger. Okay, that's good. What's the first CD you ever bought? I ever bought. I don't know. It might have been No Effects S and M Airlines. Okay. Mine was Limp Biscuit, Nookie. Nice. Uh, so you're like. Six years younger than me. I am 34. Oh, wow, you bought that young. I bought that young. Oh, man. I was in Circuit City. I remember it over in uh, Monroeville. Uh, All right. So first tape I ever bought was uh, Twisted Sister Stay Hungry. Oh, uh, there you go. Which caused a family crisis. Oh, really? Because I was like eight years old. And, you know, my I, mom's mom's like, you bought a tape that has a song called You're Gonna Burn in Hell? Oh, my God. Family crisis. Wow. Were so your parents... Was, were your parents like, uh, were they more reserved? Well, we weren't very religious, but I was the oldest. I have two younger sisters, uh, and you know, I was a. You're like, oh, I, I got the. I was a dipshit, man. Yeah. My sisters <laughs> suffered for the sins of me, you know? That's interesting. They weren't allowed to, you know, when I left the house, they're like, there's no MTV. You're not allowed to listen to, you're to, be, to be the be elder part of culture. To be the oldest got to be difficult. Like, my brother was six years older than me. So, like, he's giving me Bone Thugs and Harmony, like, yeah. No Limit Soldiers yeah. and shit like that. Yeah. And, like, you know, all these things. And I kind of was, like, more forgiving, like, movies. My mom's like, yeah, watch all these R rated movies, whatever you want to do. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to think about that. Twisted sister caused a ruckus huh oh yeah family crisis <laughs> that's so good uh okay so uh what's the best concert you've ever been to best concert i've ever been to yeah man i gotta think about that you a big concert guy yeah what's the last one you've been to uh the bad religion show social distortion at stage e how was that i hated it why i just it was too many people i was too tired <laughs> it was oversold everything was soggy yeah and like i've seen bad religion before it seemed like they kind of slowed down to play an arena show yeah and i hate social distortion so i was like i'm leaving yeah, I uh, I am no I have no reservations about walking out of a show. I went to go see Knocked Loose a couple months ago, which yeah. is like a heavy yep. ass band, and they oversold the fuck out of yep. it. You could not walk, and uh, I was like, I got to get out of here, especially Knocked Loose because uh, yeah, once the once the show starts, oh my god, people half, are. Half I'm like by the bar, pit. and you're still getting pushed, yeah. and I'm like, bro, come on now. Yeah. So I I skate out. Uh, I saw Jeff Rosenstock. Uh, in New York City a couple of years ago when he did like a, a live album from New York City. Wow. Uh, I saw two or three shows up there. That was great. Uh, Failure, the band I mentioned before, I've seen them a couple of times. I think I saw them at Mr. Small's and they played that album in its entirety. And I was behind the sound guy and the sound guy got so pissed off me because I was like, yeah, fuck it. <laughs> The guy's like, you need to move. And I was yeah. like, oh, Distracted him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's good, though. Uh, Sonic Youth at the Three Rivers Arts Festival in like 2005. I think wow. it was the first time I saw them. They played free. What was free the Three show. Rivers Arts Festival like back in 2005? Where was it at? Uh, the main stage was on the at the point. Oh, uh, okay. Back whenever uh, it was good. Like, uh, not on the, you know, like there's, it, it was inside like the triangle like, yeah. between the city and the highway. Uh, and it was, you know, it was busy as shit because it was Sonic Youth in the mid-2000s, and that was, like, the first time I'd seen them live. That's good, though. Show. And, oh, dude, honorable mention, Broken Social Scene, scene in, like, 2008, right before I almost got divorced. Great show. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Okay, uh, third to last question. You're getting ready to go on a road trip. Uh, actually... Man, I almost forgot it. Yeah, third to last question. You're getting ready to go on a road trip. Uh, you go into a gas station. You're buying a snack. What is it? Uh, definitely like a liter of Mountain Dew, which I only drink on road trips because I try not to drink soda because I drink enough beer that I probably shouldn't drink sugar too. Yeah. Uh, and either a Snickers bar or Cool Ranch Doritos. 
Those are good choices. Cool Ranch. I like a Cool Ranch. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, second to last question is the Death Row Meal. Uh, the Death Row Meal is you get a last meal before you get put to death. You get an appetizer, a main course, and a dessert. Please right. be specific. What would it be? Appetizer, main course, dessert. Yeah. Uh, hot garlic wings from, I forgot the place it's called now, but it used to be the Hop House. On Green Tree Road, back in the day, it's still out smoking. Their hot garlic wings, perfect. Okay. Main course. Main course. Man, I don't know. Something from Dish in the South Side. Okay. Maybe the gnocchi? It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, Dish is great. A dessert? You dessert guy? Well, we used to, we, uh, Yeah, dessert. Uh, I did. Uh, went to a beer festival in Baltimore in the 2012, 2013. It's a beer and oyster festival at a brewery, right? Okay. So it's four hours, all you can eat oysters, all you can drink beer. Hell yeah. So four hours of eating oysters, drinking beer with like, I think we had 13 people down there that year, just friends that I convinced we should go down there. And the one vendor is, uh, he has oyster ice cream. Ice cream? So it took us like two and a half, three hours in the festival laughing at it. You know, like Pee Wee Herman looking at the snakes every time he's rescuing all the animals out of the pet shop and big adventure. Like, yeah. Ha, oyster ice cream, what a dork. So finally, about three hours in, I'm like, I said, I'm going in. Let's do this. So it's this like Cajun guy in Baltimore with oyster ice cream. And I'm like, all right, let's try it. Try it. I'm like, oh, shit, that's not bad. He's like, got to try it with a hot sauce. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? And that's what his main thing was. He was selling hot sauce. Wow. He's like, got to try that Thai peanut hot sauce on the oyster ice cream. I was like, you're fucking crazy. I'm trying good? this. And I was like, this is so fucking good. Wow. I just saw on TikTok, uh, it was somewhere, I've been looking like a places to go travel. We've been looking at Maine, but I've been getting these people that make like a lobster and butter ice cream. I saw that. Yeah. There's like chunks of lobster in it. And I was like, I would eat that. I would try it. Um, that's after, the, after the oyster ice cream, I'm like, you know what? I'm down. Just got to try if shit. You, if, you're, if you're like, I made this and it's good, I'm yeah. like, okay. I'm Are sorry. you an adventurous eater? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, only, the only thing I won't eat is a banana because I'm allergic to them. Oh, okay. Which sucked when I was training for a marathon and I couldn't eat a banana. Yeah, a little oh, potassium, man. all that. Yeah. Well, what's your uh, What's your go to at Piper's? Oh man, whatever, the, whatever, <laughs> whatever. Jim Sherwood cooks for me. You know, I'm I'm, in, I'm immersed in the in the, yeah. in the food there. Uh, but in the fish and chips, fucks. Yeah, it's our number one seller, hands down. Uh, I love our breakfast. We make our own beans, like a, the English style beans. I don't think I've beans, been to eggs, toast. We make our own bangers. I don't think I've been Bre- there for breakfast. Breakfast is a brunch. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's what I mean. A, breakfast is a soothing thing. Okay. In the boxy, obviously. Yeah, the boxy is yeah. unreal. Uh, okay, that's great. Uh, last question: If you could have a conversation with anyone alive or dead, who would it be and why? Oh man, it's a tough one. Alive or dead, and why? Anthony Anthony Bourdain. I think he's probably the I'm most. A, I'd want to punch him in the mouth. Why? I just would. Why? You, you're not a boarding guy. It, it's like Fight Club. Take yeah. that. Take down the biggest person you know. Yeah, I, I guess am. So. A, I am the big boarding. I read his. You know, when I was working this bar in Swickley in, in 1998, uh, the, his book came out. Yeah, Kitchen Confidential. Confidential, and it was a, a turning point. Like I don't know if I want to do this for a living. I read that, and I was like, this guy's a fuck up. And he's doing it at 40. Yeah. Fuck. It. So, so you, yeah, he gives yeah. you like a little bit of like, uh, you know, I could do it too. Almost, well, you know, you're you're 22 years old, don't want to do with your life. Yeah, and you feel like you know everyone has told you, you know, working in the kitchen is is worthless. Working in the restaurants is worthless. It's something only kids do. Yeah, and you got somebody that's doing it, and you know, fuck it, this yeah. is what I'm gonna do. I like it. I enjoy it. And again, the, the social aspect. I'm opening up my house. Please come see me. It's great to see it. Good yeah. to see you. You're, you're a host. That was the, the, the probably the worst thing about when I was working at Mindy's. I was just doing prep work. You know, I'm just talking, giving the same three mm. people the same story every fucking day, and they were sick of me, and I was sick of telling them that story. <laughs> like, give me some, give me a new crowd. You need to some work. fresh crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. It is. <laughs> Which is how, that's how you got me on here. Like, oh, a sucker that doesn't know about me, he's gonna learn about my lore. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's uh, that's good though. That's that makes sense. It's a good answer. Uh, but he's probably he's probably been the most picked. I think. Uh, it's right there, Kitchen Confidential. Yeah. Uh, but. I mean, I think that this was a great episode. I appreciate you coming over and talking to me about it. Thanks for having me. Was your well, I mean, was this a good experience for you? Yeah, we'll get to sit around and talk. Yeah, again, social guy. Social you, you guy. Ask me some questions. I'll keep talking. Um, are you? Uh, you're always at Piper's. I'm pretty much always at Piper's. Right always now. at Piper's. Yeah. Hell yeah! What's like the next big thing going on there? Uh, we need to get uh, open for seven <clears> days. Get uh, twelve more draft lines running, so we're not just running twelve. 
be up to 24 draft lines. Uh, and Cascale, which was something we did pre-pandemic, which is a big passion of mine. I need to get back to that. The hell was that? Traditional British method of dispensing beer. Oh. Ever met anybody went to Britain, had the beer, and said it was warm and flat? That's, that's what it is. So there's no CO2, like a, a modern draft system, you have CO2 pushing the beer out. Yeah. It's cold. It's it's regulated. It's it's pasteurized. It's Was this just gravity? Uh, we have a pumps. So you basically, like a, like a well, you pump the beer up from the basement into a fine glass. Wow. So there's, there's a whole, we could do a whole episode on my my passion for that, probably. <laughs> Uh, but that's that's one of the things, you know, like in the in the last meeting, you know, Drew and I are fighting about what we do. And I was like, hey, get fucking cast back. Yeah, look you're at like, me, I'm look making at, this look happen. Me, look, look me in the eye, you fucker. I know where your tells are now. <laughs> so, so I mean, what is, uh, I mean, what about events as far as obviously the Euro just happened? Is there any yeah. other crazy shit coming up? Uh, there's Olympic soccer in the next few weeks, but Olympic soccer isn't as big. Isn't as know. big. Uh, the EPL starts for second week in August. Are you a big soccer guy? I I exist in a world of soccer. Yes, yeah, so, I, I, I have I have a team. I like Wolverhampton. Um, it goes on over my head. You know, like I, I appreciate the game. I love the game. Were you only appreciative of the game after you started to work at Pipers? No, I mean I grew up playing ice hockey. Okay, it's the same game. That's fair, but there's you know, definitely people that would disagree and say that it's not good. Well, those people don't understand it. That's best, fair. The too. Best thing about soccer is there's no commercial breaks, so they will play for 45 minutes straight and just. I don't know how and people, people... People like nothing happens. Like everything is happening. That's what I was just going to say. I don't know why people say that nothing happens because it's so interesting and it, it, you're just buzzing the whole time. Yeah. People are running fucking 12 miles a game. Yeah. Insane. Um, people with ADHD can't understand it. You know, do, they're like, oh, I can only watch this 11 seconds. I have to look at my phone and text. That's what somebody, it is. You know? That's what it is. The phone is a ruiner. Yeah. Do you think that you guys will have a big turnout for that game that's happening at uh, Heinz Field? Is it happening at Heinz Field? Yeah. Is, is that uh, it's Friday night? Who is that? Uh, Liverpool and I forget the other team. Yeah, Liverpool. No, yeah. Does does like I mean like do you guys have like a does stuff like that make it you know a bigger crowd? Uh, I mean that happens in North Shore. Yeah. So it's not like if you want to go to that game, you're gonna go to that game. You're not going to Pipers to watch it. Yeah. I so guess it's so. also like uh, I feel I feel it's like, like it's also like a preseason game. So if you're a big Liverpool guy and you want to see your favorite Liverpool guy play, he is not playing in that game. Yeah. You know, unless unless your favorite guy is third string. That's a good tender. point. The way I was thinking of it, though, is I feel like, you know, people might come here for the game and then, like, the next day be like, yeah, there's a footy yeah. ball. There's a yeah. footy pub here. Yeah. You know, we're going to go check it out. I mean, that's absolutely where Southside is right now. We were mobbed with Philly fans all weekend. I bet. Because, I bet. That's you know, crazy. The Pittsburghers are like, we're not going to the Southside. It's too busy. And it's like, it's not busy down here People are anymore. like, we'll definitely go to the Southside because Pittsburgh Pickleburg was insane. Right. Not only that, there's a lot of Airbnb, Airbnbs in Southside. Yeah, there is. So that's a good point. Philly fans, like if you're from Philly, like Southside is kitty land compared to fucking Kensington. You know, absolutely. <laughs> that's a good fair point too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming over. Uh, take a second and tell everyone where they could, you know, follow you, where they could come and uh, get some good food and some good beers and Scotch whiskeys. Yeah. So Piper's Pub, 1828 East Carson Street. Beautiful South Side, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're sandwiched between the two culinary delights of the South Side Burger King, the famous South Side Burger King. Hilarious. And Primanti Brothers. I mean, what, what so, more could you want? Have you seen some wild shit at that Burger King there? I've heard one of the greatest <laughs> things I've ever heard. Before, before it went rogue, it was, it was trifling. Like, they lost, the, they lost their accounts. Like, the Burger King truck wasn't dropping off with regularity anymore, so they are picking up their food from Giant Eagle, Restaurant Depot, whatever, and, you know, it's a summer day. I just step outside to catch some air, look at some people, and I hear from the drive-thru, what the hell you mean you ain't got no burgers? It's in your damn name! <laughs> I'm going back inside. I'm like, that's 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 a highlight of my day. Too much. All right. Everyone else that's listening, appreciate it as usual. Each and every week, we're back with another great guest doing great things in the city. Uh, thank you for listening. Call you right back. Telephone. I'll call you right back, podcast.